we have come to the final program. Once you get started, the train leaves the track, and before we know it, it's over. It's been a really rich year, I think, and I want to thank everybody who's helped make this possible. Uh, it takes a lot of people to put together a program like this, and uh, we appreciate th your support and, of course, your key as participants. The kind of quality questions you ask always leave our speakers, I think, impressed. Before introducing today's speaker, again, I have a few, just a couple of announcements. First, again, notice the video cameras are here today recording this program uh, for the YouTube site for James City County. You can access that site, youtube.com, James City County, all one word, uh, and get access to the speaker for the 12th of March. Uh, Mr. Simoles, Frank Simoles, who talked on U.S.-China trade, is uh, up on that site as, uh, as of a few days ago. And today's speaker will also uh, be featured on the site. And next year we're hoping to uh, have um, the whole series uh, featured. It gives a chance for the broader Williamsburg uh, area to take advantage of these fine lectures. Now, um, you know what this is. You know what to do with it. I will not make another comment about that. And again, as we have had throughout the series, uh, Elaine Fimo and Diane Letterer will be on the microphones. And thanks to both of you for helping uh, our Q&A program uh, at the end of the talk go so well. So raise your hands if you have a question to pose, uh, and they will get a mic to you. David Martin, Warner Booker Distinguished Professor of International Law Emeritus at the University of Virginia. Dave is a leading scholar in immigration, constitutional law, and international law. He's really helped to shape the development of this field within American legal education when courses on immigration law did not exist. He helped to introduce it, and he, uh, along with a, uh, a colleague, introduced the first significant casebook to be used in courses. It's now in its eighth edition. He continues, even though he is now emeritus professor at UVA, to be an educator in many ways, including yesterday at William & Mary Law School, where his casebook is being used in a class on immigration law with 45 students, and he uh, went in and taught them yesterday as well. So uh, that connection uh, it was, it was very nice and something that I know our William and Mary students uh, greatly enjoyed. He has not only uh, been a educator at the uh, University of Virginia Law School since 19, uh, 1980, retiring in 2016, but he has taken time at various points in his career to also shape policy. Again, he's a pioneer in this area. He, in the Carter administration, was asked to join the then new Human Rights Bureau that uh, Secretary of State uh, Warren Christopher had created and to help them begin to develop uh, legal uh, responses and policy responses on areas of refugee uh, and immigration issues. In, during the Obama administration, he returned for a year to serve as principal deputy general counsel in the Department of Homeland Security. And from 19, uh, 2015 to 2018, he served on the federal government's Homeland Security Advisory Council. He educates not only in the classroom, but also through publishing numerous books and scholarly articles and contributing commentary in places like the Washington Post, uh, the New York Times, Vox, The Hill, the International Herald Tribune, and the National Law Journal, among others. 
I'm pleased to say he's a graduate of uh, my ma alma mater, undergraduate institution, DePaul University, and the Yale Law School. I did not go to the Yale, so <laughs> I cannot claim that. Uh, he clerked for Justice Lewis Powell and held uh, a German Marshall Fund Fellowship for Research in Geneva. And he has been very active within the legal uh, area of immigration law and various associations. We're privileged to have somebody of his expertise who combines a con distinguished record in the academy with hands-on experience in shaping government policy on these important issues. And he will address us today on refugees and migration. David, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks very much. Uh, I think this, this mic is on, is that right? I'm wired up in some uh, unusual ways here. I'll see if I can keep this, just keep from getting tangled in that. Uh, thank you very much, Don, for that generous introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back in Williamsburg. I have lots of fond memories of this place for academic conferences, for legal conferences. Uh, as Don mentioned, my former boss was Lewis Powell, who had a very special place in his heart for Colonial Williamsburg. But I think what I remember most is being here on several occasions, driving over from Charlottesville with my children when they were young. We explored, it was a really good introduction to a lot of important historical lessons. And then I've been able to reproduce that with my grandchildren. And actually, as I think back on it, um, it goes back to when I was the child and my parents brought me here to Williamsburg <laughs> uh, when I was about 10 years old. Uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful time. So I, I appreciate the invitation from the League of Women Voters, a wonderful organization. I'm really glad to be able to, to take part uh, in this important program. Now, migration has always been a feature of human existence. Today, it's a hot political topic, the source of much benefit to receiving nations and to the migrants themselves, but also a chronic source of tension and conflict. The chapter on this subject in your 2019 Great Decisions volume provides a broad and enlightening and, and I have to say generally discouraging picture of today's migration, both internal and external, across national borders and, and internally. The topic is potentially enormous, so I've got to be selective. And I'm going to focus on a part of that overall picture that has engaged me for much of my professional life as a scholar and a teacher of immigration law and also as a person lucky enough to work on these issues in fairly high-ranking positions in government. In three separate departments, actually I had, I had one other stint besides the ones that Don mentioned. I was, uh, in, during the Clinton administration, I was in the Justice Department where the Immigration and Naturalization Service was then located as general counsel and uh, participated in some really significant developments during that time. So um, I was in those positions in three different departments, State Justice and Homeland Security in three separate administrations spread over a 35-year period. Uh, Doing that, I had the opportunity to go beyond the law and get familiar with operational realities on the ground through contact with officers holding many different roles and with concerned citizens and foreigners trying to deal with the machinery or advocate for changes. I got to help perpetrate policy, actually. Um, that is, to design it and to implement it, ranging from small changes in guidance memos to the implementation of a massive new piece of legislation back in 1996 those experiences were most valuable to enhance my teaching and my writing. Now today I'm going to focus primarily on the immigration scene here in the United States. There's lots more to talk about on the global scene. If people want to go into that in the question and answer period, that would be fine. Uh, I will analyze several key problems we now face and I'll sketch my ideas for how we could, with the right political will, implement a lasting set of solutions. My objectives are both to protect and improve our provisions for legal immigration and also to lay the groundwork for resolute and effective immigration enforcement in the future. But political will, that's a tough nut to crack. Uh, I hope my proposals will make sense to you as a framework. They are not a prediction, unfortunately, of what will happen. The obstacles are enormous. What I offer is a sketch to facilitate someday what might happen. For many reasons, now is a troubling and unpromising time to discuss immigration policy. As a society, our capacity for engaged conversation seems to have withered. 
Much of our public dialogue is just a competition of sound bites, not a back and forth testing of factual understandings or the workability of various strategies for overcoming complex challenges. Commentator Jason Willick has described it well, and I quote, instead of a set of public spirited representatives bargaining for partial victories, we are now watching maximalist factional leaders performing ideological purity rituals to increase their status within their tribes. He was speaking about a broad range of issues, but it certainly fits the immigration context. Unfortunately, we now see strengthened purity police, if I can call them that, positioned across the political spectrum on immigration. Some are dug in on the right and want both stern enforcement and sharp cuts to legal migration, crowd-pleasing chants to build the wall are a staple of certain rallies, even though, I want to emphasize this, most Border Patrol agents, and I'd say certainly almost any Homeland Security budget officer, if allowed to speak candidly, would say that a 2,000 mile wall is a waste of money. Selected locations for new structural barriers, yes, but only as part of an overall strategic plan layering in additional enforcement measures. Now, others are dug in on the left. Some focus on calling for the abolition of ICE, that's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the principal agency uh, with responsibility for internal enforcement as opposed to border enforcement, and also responsible for the custody of persons being processed for deportation. Some purists have opposed any democratic deals with the Trump administration if those deals include new enforcement measures. And this was even the case, I think tragically, when there was uh, what looked like a, a promising chance to legislate full legal status for the dreamers, meaning persons who came to the United States illegally as a child and who have lived here for at least five years. Uh, the dreamers are people who have benefited from a program called DACA, Deferred Action, an, a, an executive program initiated by President Obama, uh, Deferred Action, which allowed a kind of uh, tentative status for people who came here as children and had been here for a certain period of time. Um, that uh, the Trump administration uh, has de decreed an end to DACA, but the actual termination has been held up in the courts and probably will be for a while. Uh, anyway, it looked like there was a legislative deal, as uh, many people had contemplated, to give these people, the dreamers, a secure, uh, more permanent status. Uh, but, um, but there was this opposition. And the predictable result of that kind of purism has been that there's no legislated dreamer solution in this, and prospects don't look bright now. Now others on the left are bringing pressure on local communities and police forces to resist any kind of cooperation with ICE. And they've made notable headway in that campaign. This is loosely and perhaps misleadingly called sanctuary cities, although sometimes it includes states and counties and so forth. I'll have more to say about that shortly. Purity rituals are poison to democratic deliberation, and they impose serious barriers to the kind of enterprise that I like to engage in. I'm a policy wonk, I confess it. I enjoy careful policy analysis, looking for creative ways to bridge differences and to find a middle ground consensus. And there have been some successful programs like that that I've been involved in. Nonetheless, um, although, um, it's difficult to do so in this environment. I'm going to soldier on here today because I'm convinced that we are not so rigidly divided into contending camps that eventual progress is impossible. So let me paint a picture of, current, uh, of the current attitudinal landscape. That panorama can help us design reforms that might someday succeed. In my judgment, the vast majority of Americans are in neither of those polar camps. They pay attention to immigration issues episodically, and how they react in any particular time depends on the incident that happens to spark the day's headlines. Most Americans, I believe, although not all, share genuine pride in our heritage as a nation of immigrants, and they want to see that continue vigorously. But this welcoming impulse, it's an important feature of the landscape, this welcoming impulse coexists for most of us with a concern about control, a worry that immigration could get out of hand, either through high numbers coming in, despite legal limits, um, or, through, um, or, they might, uh, or through lax screening of new arrivals in an era of significant terrorist threats. 
Now, to be clear, that impulse to control does not at all demand zero immigration or even massive cuts in numbers. It can accept relatively high levels of migration as long as the flow appears to be largely subject to deliberate decisions by the polity. So here's my main theme. Building a sustainable, workable immigration management system has to win the support of most of this conflicted constituency in the middle. To do so, we have to serve both the impulse to welcome and the impulse to control. That is, to honor our identity as a nation of immigrants while also defending our equally proud heritage as a nation committed to the rule of law. The most important way to preserve that balance is to get a solid handle on reducing illegal migration. There are both good ways and bad ways to achieve that end. So when we get away from the shouted slogans and political purity rituals, many of the objective conditions today in 2019 for achieving reform are actually pretty favorable. The overall flow, there we go, the overall flow of illegal migration uh, let's see, the overall flow of illegal mi unlawful migration to the United States has been greatly reduced as compared to a decade ago. This slide shows uh, pretty reliable estimates of the U.S. unauthorized immigrant population from 1990 through 2014. It comes from the Pew Research Center. You can see that there was a substantial rise through all the initial years from 1990 up through about 2006 or 2007 when it peaked at 12.2 million people resident here in the United States without lawful status. Um, that number then declined to 11 million around that time and then remained essentially stable for several years. That flat line there, let's see if I can get this, yeah, so here's the rising line and then this flat line does not mean that there are no unauthorized entries or overstays. There have been a few hundred thousand arrivals annually, even during this period, but they have been balanced out by a roughly equal number of exits from that category each year. And that's people returning home, people who find ways to legalize their status in this country through the regular workings of our immigration law, and deaths. In a population of 10 million, actuarially, every year there are going to be a substantial number of deaths. Um, that this picture is sharply different from the previous decade of 1999 to 2008, as you can see on the graph. During that period, the net growth of unauthorized resident population was 500,000 to 800,000 people each year, unauthorized, new unauthorized, net new unauthorized uh, residents. That flow was bri visibly bringing major and stressful changes to many communities throughout the nation in terms of both social interaction and demands on local government resources. This in turn heightened demands during that period up, uh, up through the, the, the 2000s. It heightened demands from local governments in a winding, widening, widening range of destination communities to exercise that impulse for, for control through restrictionist local laws that passed in significant numbers during that period and through demands, consistent demands, for en enhanced federal enforcement. We tend to forget about that now because the theme generally sounds, sounds different in a lot of circumstances. Uh, but that stressful situation in the 2000s contributed considerably to the failure of efforts to pass comprehensive immigration reform bills in 2006 and 2007, despite a massive legislative effort by the George W. Bush administration with deep engagement by the President himself and by members of the Cabinet. Now, the total unauthorized population has continued to decline since 2014. This this next graph from slightly uh, from a, a, a different researcher, it, it reaches consistent results. Uh, it starts there in 2010, 11.7 million unauthorized residents, declining by 2017 to about 10.5 million. Approximately 70% of that population now, the settled unauthorized population, have been here for more than 10 years, meaning deep roots and connections to the community. Now the graph on the right then shows another important element of the current picture. Natives of Mexico for decades have made up well over half of our unauthorized immigrant population. 6.6 .6 million Mexican nationals were in that category in 2010, as it shows up there, the dark line on the top. Um, but in 2017, that population had declined to 5.3 million. We are seeing a steady and substantial net outflow back to Mexico. 
Now, because the graph showing unauthorized population began to turn back in 2007 to 2008, many commentators claim that this was just the product of the Great Recession, or at least they did initially. It wasn't a sign of success of efforts to control unlawful migration. But the continued decline, even with a booming economy, I think largely negates that thesis. More effective border enforcement based on thousands of new border patrol agents hired in the 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s plays a very important role. But even more important, I want to emphasize this, it's often overlooked, even more important are durable economic and demographic changes in Mexico itself. Mexico's birth rate has declined significantly. It is now 2.18 percent, not much higher than the U.S. rate, which is a little bit below replacement of, of 2 percent. The Mexican number is down from 3.5 percent birth rate in 1990 and nearly 7 percent in 1970, 7 percent. Social science experts who have studied Mexican migration for decades state that the era of large-scale mi migration from Mexico is over. That creates a lot of opportunity. Now, let's shift and start looking towards what kind of reforms should be implemented or could be implemented. We can find important guideposts toward workable and sustainable reforms by paying close attention to how localities have responded to the re reduced flow of unlawful migration since 2008, a shift from clamor for more enforcement to a very <coughs> different stance. Over the last 10 years, though the picture is by no means uniform, we've seen a significant pendulum swing at the local level in many parts of the country from demands for greater enforcement, as I mentioned, um, toward local resistance to immigration enforcement. More and more jurisdictions are restricting their cooperation with federal immigration authorities in many different forms that, as I said, are grouped together under the label of sanctuary cities. Many decline to honor ICE detainers, which are requests to hold persons identified as immigration violators who have been arrested on a state or local criminal charge. <coughs> Excuse me. Detainers ask that the named persons be held, detained, for a brief period after the criminal process has concluded, however it ends, so that ICE could pick them up for immigration enforcement purposes. Some jurisdictions decline even to notify ICE of the time when release is going to occur. Others are more selective, other jurisdictions are more selective. They will notify about persons charged with or perhaps only those convicted of serious crimes, but not for persons with lesser offenses. Now, before pursuing the implications of this shift in local attitudes, I just, I, I want to be clear about the legal framework for such detainer requests because much commentary today blurs this issue. Many of the locally arrested individuals for whom ICE serves a detainer wind up with no conviction or only a minor one. They're in jail overnight, charges are dropped or dismissed. Um, how, how, many people wonder, can they be subject to ICE arrest and removal? if they're not convicted. But let's be clear about it. The local detainees in the criminal justice system for whom ICE lodges a detainer are persons for whom deportability is clear and is not by any means dependent on conviction of a criminal act. Most detainers are issued on persons for whom ICE has virtually uncontestable evidence that they either entered without inspection or they overstayed a temporary visa admission period. Under the law, that's enough to justify deportation of such people. Whether it's a good idea, if they've been here a long time, is a separate issue. But under the law, that's enough to justify deportation, even if the criminal justice charges are dropped. Although the person will still have an opportunity in the immigration court to assert other possible claims for relief, such as political asylum. Evidence of crime, along with other factors, properly affects enforcement priorities for this group. But unless the person is a green card holder, which is just a small minority, of deportation cases, that is lawful permanent residence in the United States. Unless it's a lawful permanent resident, conviction is not a prerequisite, a legal prerequisite to de deportation. So after that aside, how did we get here to the point where we see this kind of resistance by local law enforcement organizations? Uh, it's, it, there are many jurisdictions that haven't gotten to that point, but the jurisdictions with the highest population of foreign residents uh, are the ones that have, have, have really gone into this in a big way. Well, this is in an arena where before 2010, as I mentioned, there had generally been cooperative relations and the federal government was seen as rightfully taking the lead on both priorities and enforcement strategies. Have these law enforcement organizations, there we go, 
uh, back to that slide, have these law enforcement organizations been converted to the doctrine that there should be no immigration control? Have they become believers in open borders? The evidence is quite to the contrary. And this is what provides a solid but unappreciated foothold, in my view, for finding a way out of our lengthy stalemate over immigration reforms. These sanctuary policies, local sanctuary policies, have taken root precisely because the last 10 years have seen such a decline in illicit border crossing, <laughs> as reflected in, in these graphs. The unauthorized population is stable in a great many locations. Unlike the high growth era of the early 2000s, such people, after years of living here, have been woven into the economic and social fabric of the, their local communities. The police chiefs and mayors who are staking out a sanctuary stance are not calling for withdrawing the border patrol from the border or wholly abandoning immigration controls. They implicitly depend, depend on effective border enforcement to make sanctuary feasible for a finite group of people who are already here. What, is, what has sparked their resistance to cooperation is the perception that in the current climate their cooperation with ICE will ensnare mostly long-term residents of the community, persons with deep ties to local employers, churches, soccer leagues, civic organizations, etc. Moreover, in the early days of the federal program called Secure Communities, which automated the sharing with ICE of fingerprints taken upon a local arrest and booking, a great many of the affected people were put into ICE processing based not at all on major criminal charges, but on low-level offenses and arrests. Notable among those was driving without a driver's license. But here's a key factor. The rollout of this Secure Communities Program came shortly after a wave of state law changes that made it impossible for people without legal status to get a driver's license. That those restrictions were enacted in a kind of stampede in 2007 and 2008, again, before, the, bef before the, the demographic picture changed. Uh, because about 70%, as I mentioned, of the current unauthorized population has been here for more than 10 years, the risk of finding long stayers in the jail arrest line is quite high. Now, I doubt we would have seen the same growing backlash against cooperation with ICE, feder uh, with ICE if federal officers from the beginning had exercised more careful discretion to issue detainers only against recent violators or persons with serious criminal charges. This is highly important. Sheriffs mostly wouldn't object. I'm, I'm quite convinced from many conversations with them, sheriffs and police chiefs, they wouldn't object to action against someone who entered without inspection, say, three months ago, or a tourist who has overstayed, uh, whose, whose admission period expired seven months ago and then got arrested in a bar fight. My judgment is that virtually no such local officials are opposed to all immigration control, but are instead are rebelling against what they see as a disproportionate sanction, deportation, being imposed on long-standing and well-integrated residents. If that is correct, if that is correct, then there's a very different way to start winning back their cooperation and making headway on a broader and better designed enforcement agenda. It's a strategy that should gain support for resolute enforcement from a far wider segment of the public, from left and right. We need to make sure that the focus of enforcement is on recent violators in a way that sends a clear, future-oriented deterrent message to others contemplating unlawful entry or overstay. The clearest, cleanest, most effective way to do so is through legalization of long-staying unauthorized residents. That's a key element in my view, even though I'm absolutely committed to serious and resolute enforcement over the long run. Uh, legalization would happen through a phased process that would include certain penalty fees and other requirements. Most of today's opponents to an expansive legalization, uh, proponents for an expansive legalization program of the kind that actually passed the Senate by a remarkably lopsided vote in 2013, 68 to 32, it passed the Senate a huge bipartisan majority. Most of those proponents focus on humanitarian reasons to legalize, namely to recognize the contributions of those who have lived and worked in our communities. Now that's a solid and worthy foundation for supporting legalization. But I emphatically want to emphasize, to add, that those who seek a healthy and vigorous enforcement system, stable and sustainable over the years, should support legalization as well. For many, that's deeply counterintuitive, but as a practical matter, 
Legalization is indispensable in order to free up enforcement resources and immigration court capacity to deal with new and recent violations. Legalization done right actually empowers resolute enforcement against the remaining pool of violators and future violations. Now, Attorney General Jeff Sessions clearly took a different view on that, but I frankly never understood where he thought his strategy was going over the long run. He took great delight in September of 2017 in announcing what he thought would be the end of the DACA program, that program for people who came here as children and had been here for at least five years. He seemed to think that draconian enforcement against that group of residents was a key step in restoring the rule of law. His speech that day emphasized that this was a step toward restoring the rule of law. But in my view, probably the single most counterproductive step the federal government could take was to focus onerous enforcement on people whose core violations occurred when they were children and were not culpable for the choices involved. And polls show that a large majority of Americans rejects the removal of the dreamers. So, if we're going to make any headway on these issues, the enforcement focus needs to be on recent immigration law violators for whom there is a much greater consensus about the justice of enforcement and for whom a swift return, for, thi for that category, re recent violators, for them a swift return to the country of origin sends a far more effective deterrent message than the deportation of Americanized children or of other long stayers who have largely lost touch with their former homelands. Only by patiently widening the circle of support for measured and balanced enforcement action can we gradually find our way to sustainable equilibrium, an equilibrium that also preserves public support for our traditional levels of legal permanent migration. Now, laid the groundwork. As a matter of policy science, I emphasize, rather than immediately actionable political will, there's been surprising consensus on the basic elements of a solution. It includes three main parts. First, as I mentioned, would be a generous legalization or amnesty program with conditions for most of the 10 million in the current unauthorized population. There would be a cutoff date, so it had to establish residence by a certain date, say two or three years in the past. Uh, the persons involved would probably have to pay various fines and fees. Persons with any significant criminal record wouldn't qualify. The remaining elements amount to steps to minimize and deter future illegal migration so that we don't get ourselves into the same soup again a decade or so down the road with a newly arrived population of millions of unauthorized residents. So element two there uh, would be revisions to our legal migration provisions, both permanent and temporary migration, visitor visas as well as, as green cards. The point is to make um, those categories better match up with immigration pressures and desires. This reform is important, but it comes with a very big caveat. Some commentators suggest that we can provide legal channels spacious enough to capture or satisfy nearly all migration pressures or desires to the United States. This is simply, simply wrong. Migration intentions are not static. An expansive guest worker program, for example, uh, would, would generate rising pressure for more such migration on the part of foreign workers and especially on the part of U.S. employers. That reality has to be addressed through proper program design that helps make sure temporary migration remains temporary. And more broadly, in a world of 7.5 billion people, the latest reliable estimates, we cannot conceivably hold forth an opportunity for all who might like to come to the United States. We will still need to choose, and we will still need to say a firm no to a lot of perfectly fine, productive, hardworking people who would like to migrate and could probably do so quite successfully. Nonetheless, despite that caveat, better tailoring of our legal immigration categories is worthwhile. We can improve our provisions for employment-based migration and also phase out some family-based categories that are now facing enormous backlog, particularly the category for siblings of U.S. citizens, for which the minimum waiting time is now about 15 years. That would enable quicker unification of the remaining family categories. Some of those are also backlogged by a decade or so, for example, for grown uh, children, children over 21 years of age, children of U.S. citizens. Um, 
I would argue also against, signif against significant cutbacks in the overall family admission ceiling, as some have urged in order to free up more spaces for high-skilled employment-based immigrants. Recent scholarship is showing that family-based migrants make significant and underappreciated contributions to the health of our economy, not significantly different, not significantly less than the measurable economic benefit derived from those explicitly selected based on skills. That too is counterintuitive, but the scholarship shows why that is, is probably the case. We're, we're not good at guaranteeing, at choosing individuals and guaranteeing what kind of outcomes they will have. Um, people who come under many different categories can, uh, can, can be make the successful transition. The, the, f the scholarship demonstrates how an existing family network speeds the transition of new arrivals, fosters early integration, and improves resilience as one moves on to other jobs. Now, we should also restore refugee admissions through our long-standing quota resettlement programs to historic levels of 50 to 100,000 a year, especially now in a time of historically high global resettlement need. This would replace the 20,000 or fewer that the Trump administration is aiming for, historically low numbers of refugee admissions. And I'm committed to the view that taking in refugees is a key part of who we are as a nation. Doing so through quota resettlement programs poses few problems from a control standpoint. We screen people in those quota programs, we screen people overseas, mostly in refugee camps, before they are approved to resettle, and we set exact numbers and allocations annually. That amenability to control stands in sharp contrast to the other route to refugee protection in the United States, political asylum claims filed by people already on U.S. soil. This cluster of challenges is being demonstrated graphically but this political asylum challenge is being demonstrated graphically and tragically along our southwest border today. I'll say more about asylum before I close. Element number three of my reform agenda there might be a surprise. It's resolute enforcement against a reconceived target landscape focused on recent and new violators. It has many components. In part, it's a matter of continued border deployment, which we've talked about. The Border Patrol is now five times larger than it was when I was first in government in 1978, and it has had a notable and durable effect on border crossings, as this slide shows. There it is. That's Border Patrol apprehensions by year from fiscal 1990. You can see the numbers were high. B apprehensions are used as a, a rough measure of the ongoing flow, although it's, it's, it's an imperfect indicator, but it's the best that we have. Um, you can see in 1990 there were 1.1 million apprehensions by the Border Patrol. That rose to 1.68 million in one year in 2000. Then it started to decline, somewhat uneven, and then you see a sharp decline starting about 2007 and 2008 to where in recent years, this goes up through 2018, it fluctuates between 300,000 and 450,000, um, about a quarter of, of the the highest level. Um, now, it, the picture is changing a bit here in 2019, but we'll talk about that later. So a key step to achieving effective enforcement is restoring the capacity, well, let's see, uh, the, the, next, the next element here. There we go. Is restoring the capacity of our immigration courts, which have record level backlogs. Backlogs in 2000 were about 100,000, which is really just kind of normal processing, keeping pace with incoming cases. And then starting about 2008, 2009, the funding was neglected. The cases slowed up. The number of immigration judges didn't increase. That's the, the orange line across the top or brown line there. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the overall backlog grew enormously to where today it's at about 800,000 uh, in the backlog. So cases are being scheduled, new cases are being calendared for two or three years out. Such delays deeply undercut and demoralize all other parts of the enforcement agenda. Mastering this situation, the clog ups in the immigration courts, is not just a matter of hiring new judges, which can be a glacially slow process. A broad legalization program could be the most effective single stroke to make av uh, available to make the immigration court system work well again. Hundreds of thousands of people depicted in those blue bars there would be diverted out of court 
with a, with a legalization program to a speedier administrative process with their, uh, w that would assess their eligibility for naturalization, uh, I'm sorry, for legalization. And if they qualify, produce the dismissal of hundreds of thousands of uh, deportation cases. Further, resolute enforcement involves pursuing serious, fair interior enforcement, the domain of ICE. We need gradual restoration of carefully designed cooperation programs with state and local governments. Um, this will probably have to wait until we're several months into legalization so that there's skeptical local jurisdictions can feel confident that those efforts would largely spare longtime residents. Um, this doesn't mean that in any situation I'm contemplating that local law enforcement agents would become immigration agents. Uh, instead, um, local law enforcement should concentrate on doing their own jobs, enforcing the criminal law. Uh, but after legalization, local law enforcement should, should simply cooperate with requests for information and handovers to ICE in response to detainers, people already arrested under local law. Another crucial change is to supplement direct government enforcement with measures that will discourage migration by drying up job opportunities for the unauthorized. This can work because nearly all illegal migration is undertaken for jobs, not to get on the welfare rolls. Today, effective employer screening of new hires is often easily defeated by false documents. But we have an existing and well-tried system that allows employers to do a simple computer check of the work authorization of their new hires. Right now, participation in this system called E-Verify, or electronic verification, is largely voluntary with employers but even so, over 50% of new hires now go through this system. Reform legislation would phase in mandatory participation by employers. E-Verify is highly promising. It is vulnerable still to certain kinds of fraud. It would, it would clean up and police against mo the most common kinds of frauds that gave problems in the, the, the old-fashioned system enacted in 1986. But it's still vulnerable to certain kinds of identity fraud, and steps would have to be taken to address those issues. Finally, we should undertake a new and systematic campaign to enforce the law against visa overstayers. People who enter legally on a temporary visa but then don't leave when they should. Contrary to the popular image of undocumented workers, most new immigration violators today are overstayers rather than people who sneak across the border. The best estimates say that has been the case actually for the last seven to 10 years. In the past three years, overstayers have accounted for about 60% of new immigration violators. Now for decades, overstay enforcement has been a very low priority for the enforcement agencies. This hasn't changed much, even though we now have new Homeland Security data systems that can provide each week a very reliable list identifying those who, who stay expired but for whom there's no evidence that they actually left the country. We can and should change this picture we need to assign a large cohort of ICE officers to take that list, that full list, locate the violators, and then put them promptly into removal proceedings. Now, to be clear, the data systems I'm talking about identify violators, but they won't generally tell ICE where an overstayer is currently located. Nonetheless, finding a high percentage is certainly doable for a, a trained investigator. They do this all the time. And we don't have to guarantee finding anyone, everyone for this policy change to be effective. The visible prospect of swift and lasting consequences for new overstay violators will have an important multiplier effect. There would still be violations, but all persons here in temporary status would learn that they must take seriously that end date printed on their admission card. Spontaneous compliance should, should quickly improve. Now, applying serious resources to these diverse efforts would provide a powerful and early indicator of commitment to resolute enforcement. Enforcement tempered by a strong focus on new violators. This would give us the real-world capacity to realize the new enforcement agenda if coupled with legalization. So that's a broad picture. I'm going to shift my focus for the final few minutes of my talk here. The reforms just sketched would, I believe, address the primary immigration problems that have preoccupied our policy, polity for two decades. They would lay the foundation for one day achieving a stable and sustainable U.S. immigration system, a system affording reasonable assurance that ordinary migration is under control. They would also honor America's impulse of welcome 
by providing the political space to preserve our expansive range of legal admission, from family-based to employment-based to humanitarian-based refugee admission. But there's one final arena that needs to be addressed, a form of migration that cannot be described as ordinary. It is a part of the immigration landscape that is rich with the impulse to protect or welcome while sowing worry for the impulse to control. <coughs> I'm speaking of political asylum. Under treaties, uh, a political asylum. Under treaties adopted in the 1950s and 1960s and accepted by no most nations around the world, Asylum and related protections are available to people who flee their home countries and then satisfy this definition, which the central feature is a well-founded fear of persecution and there are other qualifications on it. A fuller description of that treaty standard, as I said, appears here on the slide. But that elusively worded standard is often exceptionally difficult to apply to real-world cases for reasons of the elusiveness of the definition and also the relative inaccessibility of good evidence about what awaits the individual. The laws don't say that such protections are available to the first thousand or ten thousand or one hundred thousand who meet that definition. And applications come both from non-citizens already living in the United States, whether without lawful status, and from persons at our borders or at a port of entry. So when asylum applications escalate, and particularly when there are signs of a new large-scale influx of asylum seekers, the policy dilemmas become acute. Calls are heard for drastic measures to cut off or discourage the movement or to adopt other severe measures to deter more migrants. Of course, those calls are also challenged, usually vociferously, by others who point to genuine dangers in the home country and who insist on a wider humanitarian response. Those are the dividing lines. We're in the midst of such a dilemma now along the southwest border, as I'm sure you're aware. Tens of thousands of migrants, overwhelmingly from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, have been arriving each month to claim asylum. That population now largely consists of family units with children, but also contains a high percentage of unaccompanied minors. Their persecution claims are largely based on threats from criminal gangs or threats of domestic abuse unremedied by their home governments. Further, the U.S. government's overall capacity to respond to what's happening right along the border there is hampered by a separate surge of asylum applications filed by persons who have already spent some time in the United States. That surge is a direct product of those long backlogs in immigration court. Because if judges don't decide an asylum case within six months of the filing of the case, by law, the applicant is entitled to a work authorization card. Six months of delay, a work authorization card. And that opens legal access to employment in this country. Today's high likelihood of work authorization, because few cases get resolved within six months, very few, the high likelihood of work authorization attracts more questionable applications worsening the backlog. The situation feeds on itself and the problem expands. So what to do about this situation? President Trump says we need to build a wall. And he issued a national emergency proclamation, as I'm sure you know, on February 15th, about three weeks after the funding agreement uh, that ended the government shutdown. That proclamation was intended to free up special executive authorities and other governmental resources that the president could apply to this project, this wall project, even though Congress had expressly rejected the president's wall funding request. The president's action is wrong on so many levels. First, it blatantly intrudes on one of Congress's most important powers, the power of the purse, crucial to our system of checks and balances. Second, it is a legally incorrect application of the National Emergencies Act, a statute I dealt with fairly often in some of my earlier general counsel roles in two different departments. Some of Trump's supporters say his action cannot be criticized because the act contains no definition of emergency. Thus, the authority to decide what constitutes an emergency is allegedly left entirely to the president. Well, it's true that the act contains no definition of emergency, but dictionaries do. 
Imagine that. We should look to dictionaries. Uh, uh, the dictionary defines emergency. It's a pretty consistent definition across dictionaries. One, one example is a serious, unexpected, and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. This situation that we're facing now was not unexpected. Central American asylum applicants have been coming in large numbers since 2014. How about requiring immediate action? At his news conference announcing the proclamation, the president said, quote, I could do the wall over a longer period of time. I didn't need to do this, but I'd rather do it much faster. Astounding. Although courts routinely defer to the president on national security matters, I firmly believe the Supreme Court will rule against this proclamation. That court decision could become the most important ruling on presidential emergency powers since the court struck down Harry Truman's seizure of the steel mills back in 1952. But resolution by the high court may well take years. Now further, final point here, even if there were an asylum emergency, how does a wall address this particular, this particular situation? The distinctive and novel feature of the Central American flow since 2014 has been that the asylum seekers try to turn themselves in quickly to the Border Patrol after getting on U.S. soil. They have also been increasingly applying right at U.S. ports of entry. They are not sneaking in and hiding. Walls are not relevant. So the President's actions, recent actions, are not the behavior of a man seeking a solution to our asylum dilemmas, or indeed thoughtful overall fixes to our overall immigration system. I, I, I really regret this greatly, but they instead reveal a person seeking an issue, a grievance, a chronic nagging grievance. I worry that this might just prove to be an effective electoral strategy because conditions along the border are likely to worsen for a considerable period and chances to do other constructive things are also going to be limited because of the attitudes of some of the purists on the left as well. So the situation along the southwest border is not technically an emergency, but let's not overlearn that lesson. It's not an emergency that calls for special presidential powers, but it is genuinely a crisis and one without ready solutions at hand. The administration has been flailing about seeking dramatic new deterrents or obstacles to asylum findings, but its very desperation makes a real solution even harder. These actions have managed either to trigger widespread public condemnation, you recall the reaction to the policy of separating children from their parents, or they have fanned the flames of judicial skepticism resulting in injunctions, uh, quite a host of them. The judicial skepticism is deserved, I would say, in general, but a few court decisions, in my view, have gone too far and have unduly limited the toolbox of legitimate measures that can be deployed to cope. A truly functional Congress, should we one day find ourselves <laughs> blessed with such an institution, <laughs> would take a hard look at these decisions and legislate a wider but carefully tailored array of responsive measures when the system is confronted with sudden large-scale influxes, as we are experiencing now. Beyond that kind of legislative effort, what else should we do? That is a really hard question. That's the toughest one to wrestle with in this, in this field at this time. But I'm going to close by offering a few additional steps. First, it's back to that backlog, immigration court backlog issue. We need to restore, we really need to restore the system's capacity to adjudicate asylum cases within six months of filing so that claimants don't get work authorization unless they prove their asylum claims. That would be a substantial portion of the caseload, but they would get it only if they're successful. Those who are not successful would not get work authorization, and that's its own form of deterrent and the most just and, and, and uh, targeted kind of deterrent. There is real violence occurring in the source countries to be sure, but not everyone is equally threatened. Promptly rejecting weak or abusive claims on the merits after a hearing and then enforcing removal sends the proper kind of focused deterrent message. We're not doing much of that right now because of the backlog problem. Second, we need a sustained diplomatic effort to encourage and expand regional solutions to these issues. In recent years, Mexico has taken strides to create and expand its own political asylum mechanisms. The new Mexican government, which took office in December, has been cautiously supportive of further cooperative measures, and it has stepped up in unexpected ways to coordinate with U.S. policies 
affecting Central American si asylum seekers along our joint border. Just how far this is going to go is still quite uncertain. It's still a new administration in Mexico. Significant strains and dangers have become apparent affecting asylum seekers now forced to remain in Tijuana and other border cities while they await the slow scheduling of a U.S. asylum hearing. Nonetheless, it would be quite advantageous to keep developing a wide range of protection alternatives in the Americas, including interim work authorization in Mexico itself, as they have offered, seemed to offer, for at least a portion of the population wa awaiting asylum adjudication. Finally, we need to apply greater resources and creative diplomatic energy toward reducing the very violence in Central America that sends people in search of international protection. This would include bilateral aid, multilateral efforts, and the funding of NGO initiatives, non-governmental organization initiatives. Addressing root causes is easy to prescribe. It happens, people include that in their lists all the time. But we have to recognize that it's exceptionally hard to do effectively, exceptionally hard. We shouldn't have illusions about that. Such efforts face all the con conventional obstacles to effective foreign aid. Corruption, ineffective host governments, erratic U.S. funding, ingrained behavior. But what's the alternative? We simply do not have the political capacity to solve the problems of gang violence in our hemisphere by relocating millions of potential victims to this country. And there have been certainly some successes from AIDS, aid programs of this type. Past U.S. assistance has had some visible impact in helping to reduce gang violence and murder rates. A program called the Central American Regional Security Initiative has provided more than $1.4 billion to these efforts since its start in 2008. The Trump administration, with unfortunately characteristic short-sightedness, has, has been moving to cut this and other forms of funding to the source countries. Congress has resisted some of that, but it's an ongoing battle. We need instead to restore high funding and then assign the most creative and persistent of our diplomats and aid experts to the task of implementation. Okay. <laughs> so today, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, there's, there's, there's one final chord here that I worked on hard last night. I want to, <laughs> I want to sound it here. Today I have taken you on a long journey through difficult terrain. There's an even longer and more arduous journey ahead if we're going to overcome our political tribalism, stare down the purity police, and thereby create the political will for turning these ideas into actual policy changes. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be very happy to take, take your questions. Over here. If we have a statute of limitations on major crimes, not murder, but other I'm crimes. Sorry, where's the speaker? I'm here. Ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to to establish a statute of limitations on this problem, and then it would automatically expire? Well, that's true. People, so people would essentially uh, gain a kind of permission to stay if their violation is more than X number of years exactly. in the past. That's been proposed fairly widely. I don't think it's a workable idea. Because I think it just, it, it compounds um, the incentives for people to, to hide out in this country. And, um, and, and over time, it, it, I, I, think it, I, think it, I think it would undercut real efforts to proceed. But what I do propose is something sort of like that, but one that people couldn't rely on to keep happening over time. That's really what legalization is. It's kind of a one-time statute of limitations. Anybody whose violation occurred before sometime, let's say, two or three years ago is freed up for now. But we're really trying to build, I think this is very important, we're trying to build this as a one-time solution and then in the future stay pretty current with ongoing violations. I really think our capacities have been built up, particularly with the huge influx of new resources after 9-11 to immigration enforcement. We now can do that to achieve to keep fairly current with new violations if the system doesn't have to deal with all those, those old violations. So that, that I think is, is important. It should be a one-time event. It wouldn't preclude certain special measures again in the future, but I, I, I'm skeptical that a rolling statute of limitations would work. <laughs>
Um, this has been very helpful. But I'm thinking about Europe, Germany and the Nordic lands, and they must be doing this kind of thinking as well. And given our legacy in the Middle East, do you know if there's any discussion that we're having with the EU or any of those communities in terms of building some kind of mutuality? There certainly are efforts of that kind. I participated in, in a lot of them in my times in government in the Clinton administration, well, the Carter administration, actually, the Clinton administration and certainly with the Obama administration. There are ongoing mechanisms whereby there's that kind of sharing and coordination, um, discussions about strategies that will work. Uh, Europe does face this in a, fair, uh, in a very acute way, and it's impor important to, to recognize that. I, I, I have had some slides on this, which maybe I can, I will use, but, but the, um, the one of the, one of the really distinctive uh, initiatives undertaken over the last several years was Chancellor Angela Merkel's decision to waive certain kinds of normal restrictions and allow people, Syrians, who were going by boat from Turkey to Greece to come on to other, to further, nor further north countries. She offered a wide range of protection for, um, in Germany and tried to get it where a lot of other countries in Europe would accept those people. She was very moved by the tragedy uh, uh, along the Greek shores and particularly a photograph of a body of a three-year-old child in the water. Um, so it was, a, it was a very courageous humanitarian act. In my view, it wasn't executed in the most effective way. Um, it was sort of executed in a very European way, which is for Europe, mostly they think about refugee protection as just focused on asylum. People get here, then we apply the law and we decide whether they get to stay. For the United States, we ha also have a rich tradition, as I mentioned, of quota refugee resettlement, taking often 50, 100, even 200,000 a year after they've been chosen in a, in a refugee camp. And then they're flown deliberately to the, to, to the United States. Um, what's remarkable is that um, Chesla Merkel didn't propose that. She just said, we'll waive the other restrictions. And so people started coming. Let's see if I can get the. People started coming and just walking. The Greek, the Greek government was willing to take people to their northern border and let them go from there. And I, you may remember some of these figures. These are two of the more graphic ones of Syrian refugees um, moving across these countries. Hungary was a particular way station, and they reacted very harshly, stringing razor wire and putting military oil in there. Nobody was going to be allowed to stay there. But the, the, the impact of that was it became an enormous political issue, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware enormous backlash in Germany and elsewhere. And finally, after about seven months, the EU worked out a different agreement with Turkey that greatly restricted the flow. Uh, there was supposed to be some more orderly migration, airplane migration, but that hasn't materialized so well. Anyway, it, it, it alleviated some of the immediate tensions, but these pictures have been an extraordinary, <laughs> and similar ones, have been an extraordinary weapon used by extreme right-wing parties to gain political support, to open up wide specters of invasions of unruly crowds of, of people. And we've seen um, extreme parties gain a foothold or take control of government in many different countries. Uh, Hungary is one, Poland, Italy, Austria. Chancellor Merkel's party was greatly weakened in some later parliamentary elections. So I mean, that's part of, part of the case why I think we need, we need control, visible control, control that still has a lot of room for humanitarian protection but designs it a lot better and doesn't provide this kind of uh, uh, fuel for that. I, I tell you, you had a discussion about populist parties and I think the consensus was, and I think that's certainly the case, the immigration issue is a, it's a, has been a major and, and um, enduringly successful, unfortunately, um, part of the campaign uh, along those lines, and, and including in the United States. To your left. Over here. Sir? Here. No. Uh, Over here for yeah, a second. Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> it is in, obviously, the U.S.'s economic self-interest to greatly expand seasonal visas, work visas for agricultural workers and the like, mm -hmm. but then the fear is they don't go home. Are there any examples you know of where countries have done effective seasonal visa programs? 
there are some examples. It, it's possible um, to make that more successful than, than what we've seen. The, the, the major impact has been that um, uh, a lot of people who come as, as seasonal workers, temporary workers, um, don't stay. They get out of the cycle of, of, of return. Uh, and so, I mean, there, there was, it, it's been reduced some in recent years, but there was the uh, kind of a sardonic slogan among immigration scholars for a while, uh, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary worker program. <laughs> uh, so that was the problem. But, but if you really want to design one, there are places where it's worked. It's, it, it's worked, for example, um, shortly a, in, the, in the years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, there were a number of, of workers from, for example, Poland, who took temporary jobs in Germany, for example. Um, but because Poland was visibly improving in a lot of ways there, those, were, did, those did tend to be temporary stays. Um, got themselves some uh, currency, so, some, some earnings to help rebuild things there. So in certain circumstances, like that can work on its own. The other example of things that have been most successful are temporary worker programs that include close engagement with the government of the source country, the, the, the homeland of the, of the worker. Um, there have been some examples in the Caribbean that have worked along these lines. Um, more with other receiving countries than with the United States. But the home government gets involved and the home government wants to preserve the possibility for this kind of temporary migration because it, when they want people to come back with their dollars and help stimulate the economy locally. So there are some, success, the most successful programs have engaged families and local leaders to help make sure that the person comes back. And if somebody doesn't show that they've come back, they can, act, they can call their favorite high school teacher and say, you've got to come back because you're going to damage the prospects for this program for other people coming along or family members. Those are the most successful. They're, they're hard to do, but there's been some interesting writing about um, those kinds of possibilities. If we have temporary worker programs, we need to think about those kinds of creative ways of proceeding. To your left. Sir, do you have a solution in regards to these children, these young children, that are left here in the United States in limbo while their parents have been sent back to their homeland? There's no magic button solution for that. I, I think it's going to require, it, we, we really have to engage in very serious ongoing efforts to uh, reconnect those children with their families. And there's no way to do it but just very patient ongoing efforts. Now, and that's, that was one of the most distressing and shocking things to me about the child separation policy that we had. As, as the arrangements, it, as it became evident what was really happening, there was remarkable casualness about keeping track of the children and, and where their parents were going, keeping that connection going. That there were defective data systems. You shouldn't have launched a policy like that until you addressed the, the, the difficulties in those data systems. And that didn't happen at all, and that's created a big part of the problem. I, but I mean, it was really, I've worked with a, lo a lot of the people in Customs and Border Protection who deal with these kinds of issues. They were directed to do this sort of stuff very quickly. They tried, I think, to send signals that the data systems aren't very good, but the drive was there to go ahead with it anyway. And that's it's part of why I resigned in protest from the Homeland Security Advisory Council, which I'd been a member of since 2015, along with several other members in protest of the child separation policy. That policy had been terminated by that point, but it became clear that there was just no thought, no real thought given to reuniting them. And what, what's even more remarkable, nobody's theory of that child, uh, of that separation policy included any basis for assuming that the United States government could permanently sever that parent-child relationship. There's just, just no theory. That. There was a, an arguable legal basis for saying, well, yes, while the parent is going through criminal justice processing and is detained in a federal jail facility, they can't stay with their children. But clearly, when that criminal justice process is over, the, the, the child, the, the reunification rights take full hold. So it was, I mean, there have been a lot of things done in the immigration area where I think that the top decision makers in the administration have just, have regarded valid objections or cautionary notes coming from career people, regarded as pure obstructionism, and blow right past it, and they have paid a heavy price almost every time they've done it. That happened with the, the, the travel ban that was 
implemented in the first week of the new administration. That blew up in their faces. They backed off of that. Litigation went on. It took three different tries to get it something that actually finally passed muster with the courts. And then the child separation policy was a very significant example. Is there anyone over here? No, another child separation question, huh? Uh, I'm trying to get to. Who was it? Oh, you. Thank yes. you for coming. Um, I'm glad you like William Stewart. Um, <laughs> Thank you. My question is about the Dreamers. I'm. Uh, what? What situation? What status? do the parents of the green dreamers have? And if they have become American citizens, doesn't that give the children the right to be citizens also? Okay, so the question was about the dreamers yeah. and about, about their, their access to citizenship eventually and, and what would happen with their parents, is that, yeah. is that correct? Um, yeah, uh, it depends entirely on the kind of program that's ultimately adopted. President Obama's initiative, the DACA program, didn't provide any kind of path to really durable legal status or, or rights uh, affecting the parents. The, the, the first round of it, the one that affected the, the children, people who've been here since they, they, were, uh, they were children. Um, the, uh, the legislative proposals, most of the legislative proposals would provide a path to a green card for dreamers with certain conditions uh, apply and ultimately, well, it, it, it varies. Some say that there should never be naturalization, but most of the versions have certainly supported naturalization after a period of time. If dreamers become citizens, eventually at some point, under legislation that's not yet been enacted, they will be able to petition for their parents' migration under current laws once they're 21. And most of them are because right now the, the there are different versions of how you define the dreamer category, but um, anyway, so there would be there would be an avenue for that. Now, um, some are resisting that. Some say the some who are more skeptical about that kind of a legalization program say, well, we could maybe address the kids, but they can't have any rights to bring their parents in. Uh, President Obama also tr announced a se separate program. Maybe that's what you're referring to for the for the parents. Well, they weren't parents, it wasn't for parents of, of dreamers, although some people were pushing for that. It was just for parents of um, children who are U.S. citizens. And there are a lot of unauthorized parents who are here with young children who are American citizens because they were born on, on U.S. soil. Uh, but that got um, uh, struck down by a, a court ruling. It went to the Supreme Court when there were only eight members of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court divided on it so that that ruling stayed in place. And that program, I think, is, is effectively dead. But the focus will be on, on dreamers. I hope we will get to the point of finding a, a, a way towards permanent resident status and eventually citizenship for that group of, of dreamers. So at a minimum. I obviously hope for much more in the way of legalization, but that at a minimum. Over here. Okay. Mr. Martin, good morning. Um, morning. Shifting gears over to the island of Cuba in the Caribbean, the mm -hmm. Cuban population seems to have access to uh, the United States via political asylum. Um, given the changes in the political spectrum that is taking place in the island and the fact that political asylum in the United States now, they're able to go back to Cuba for vacationing or to visit relatives, would you challenge that category for the Cuban population under the political asylum and make them a regular refugee for economic asylums like the majority of the rest of the immigrants? Well, yeah, let me, um, let me try to uh, be a little more specific about what's been the situation with Cubans. Cubans since the 1960s have had very special, unique provisions to apply to, to Cuban nationals. And typically it wasn't it was a form of political asylum, but it wasn't done under the normal political asylum rules. It wasn't done under that definition I put up there. You didn't have to prove a well-founded fear of persecution. Under legislation enacted in, I think, 1966, the Cuban Adjustment Act, if people got here and got admitted to the country or what's called paroled in, you, you don't have a legal status, we're going to let you come in and live and not be detained and, and live in the country. If you did that and lived here initially for two years and then later it was changed to one year, you had a special program without a numerical ceiling 
for Cuban adjustment. Cuban nationals could adjust and get a green card. So that was completely unique to the, let, let, let's strike that, there shouldn't be an adjective with unique. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was unique to Cuba, and it, was the, it has been the source of lots of ongoing complaints, particularly as, say, lots more people came trying to claim political asylum under the more difficult system, the normal refugee definition system. Um, the, there have been changes in practices as of just a few years ago so that fewer Cubans can actually, are paroled in when they arrive, and so they don't get that kind of um, special legislative provision. They can't take advantage of that. They could still claim normal political asylum, say, I have a well-founded fear of persecution in Cuba, and there are people who are persecuted in Cuba. So some of those could succeed, but it would be very different from the essentially blanket permission under that 1966 statute that had applied in the past. I do think that was the right move. I think it should be uh, a more uniform kind of standard, same opportunities. I, I mean, asylum is a, is a difficult, unruly kind of provision in the immigration laws, but, but we, we figured out how largely to apply it, and I think that the same, it's good that the same rules would apply to Cubans as apply to others. Thank you. Thank you.